Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. About a year ago, we reviewed the new Wood River 4.5. That was their smoother. We now have a 5.5, which is their jack plane. It's been out for the same amount of time, but I haven't had a chance to review it, and I want to take you through it. Why? Because I think it's probably the best single-purpose plane that they make. In fact, if you were going to ask me what plane would I buy if I was only going to get one, this would be it. Two reasons. Number one, it's long enough and heavy enough to be extremely effective in the shooting board, and I'll demonstrate that at the end of the video. And two, it's not too big or too heavy to be great for general purpose on the bench. Now, I've already taken out of art and cleaned the oil off and went through all that part. And I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to duplicate stuff I already did with you on the four and a half. But I want to bring up a few points. I want to show you a few things that you can do to soup it up and make it even better. Like all the Wood River Plains, the body is made out of ductile iron, which simply means if you drop it, it's not going to break. There's stress relief, so it comes to you flat, it shall stay flat. Now, the area I'm going to spend most of my time is on the lever cap, the chip breaker, and the blade. And I'll, I'll walk you through some initial one-time preparation. Now, I think I did this on the 5.5 as well, but there's one more thing that I would do. 4.5. 5.5, sorry, with the 4.5, with the 5.5. And, and that is, I like to go and cut a chamfer all the way around. The reason is this. I'm going to wipe this oil off. When these are milled, they sometimes leave an edge that is really sharp. Problem is that in on your bench and working around, if another piece of metal hits it, leaves a ding here and leaves a raised spot on the bottom, then you start planing a piece of wood. Next thing you know, you've got a mark on your board. And I've seen more people spend an afternoon chasing, trying to chase down a nick on their blade when it was actually something on the sole. Second problem is that when you're planing a wide panel, you want to skew your plane so that you're reading an area wider than the sole. In other words, if I were to try to plane this bench flat by you holding my plane in straight like this, I'm reading a very narrow strip, and I, it would not be very. It would be very difficult to get it flat. I could end up with it slightly round or slightly concave. But as you hold your blade on a plane on an angle like that, you're reading a much wider swath, and you're able to read what you've done and what you're about to do. So just makes it a lot easier. Problem is that with these edges that sharp, sometimes it actually wants to steer the plane and have it go off to one side. So what I do is just take a regular file and come in and from the sole out towards the side, I just cut a chamfer all the way around. It doesn't have to be terribly heavy. Once I break it, then I'll just come here on a little steeper angle and then up here on a little steeper angle and get rid of any burr that might be on there. Flip that over and do the other side. And I'll do the ends as well. Doesn't take very long. Cut these corners back a little bit extra too, just because they're the part that usually ends up striking something. And then do the back. Actually, there is one more thing. That is the throat. Sometimes there's a bit of a burr left. Just a little bit right there, I can feel it. When they cut that throat out. And it'll eventually wear off, but in the initial use, you're going to have marks from, left from that. So on this side, it really doesn't serve any great function. So I'm not terribly concerned with whether or not I keep that surface perpendicular to the sole. But I do like to constantly be moving laterally as I'm moving forward, and that prevents me from leaving a ridge along that surface. Just do that until you can no longer feel a burr. Now on this side, which is the part directly ahead of the blade, that constitutes half of the throat. And that helps to control tear out when you close the throat down by bringing the blade closer to this surface. This edge bears down on the wood fiber and doesn't allow it to lift up. So that I want to remain perpendicular to the sole. And it's painted black so you can see your progress just by watching the paint get removed. And if you lose track, you can always go in there with a felt tip marker and repaint it. And again, move side to side as you're moving forward and back. And just get rid of any burn. Now occasionally I've found one over here too, but I, I'm not on this one. So just want to check that. Wipe that. So 
sometimes this pin that holds the lateral adjustment lever in can be a little bit sticky. So I take it over to the side, lift it, bend it forward, and then bend it back, and that usually does enough to free it up. I'll just get this yoke centered. Now, I want to make sure that the uh, screw holding in the knob and the rear tote are tight. They are. All right, that's good to go. I really don't need to do anything more to that other than wipe all the oil off. Okay, now the lever cap, the purpose of the lever cap is to put pressure on the chip breaker and there's a gap between the chip breaker and the blade. If you haven't noticed, there's a little lip on the underside and that lip allows so that when you put the lever cap on and cock that into under pressure, the pressure from the lever cap gets transferred to the chip breaker which then gets transferred out here under the cutting edge and helps to stabilize that blade and doesn't allow it to chatter when it's in use. So you want the underside of this to be flat and you want the underside of the chip breaker to be flat. So we need to check both of those. And I've seen times when it was slightly concave. And when it is concave, what happens, it'll put pressure on the outside corners, driving them down into the wood, and then you're constantly chasing plane tracks, unable to get rid of them. And it's not a matter of the, how you sharpened the blade, it was set up of your chip breaker or your lever cap, so we'll check both. So the first thing I need to do, I'm gonna use my, my uh, stone. Now I've just turned my uh, 16,000 grit stone over and I'm working on the glass side of it. I just want these two surfaces to be pretty close to uh, even. Actually this is a little bit low so I'm going to put this rubber mat underneath it. There. And then I can just put a little bit of hone right on there to lubricate it. I'm working the glass side of this just because I need some support for the back side of the lever cap. I'll set that on there. Distribute the pressure as evenly as I can. So I've got thumb, middle finger, or ink middle finger and index finger. Index finger and middle finger to distribute the pressure so that it's not bearing on one side more than the other. Just take a few seconds and then flip it over and you'll be able to tell. Now sometimes it's hard to see because the metal has been already work so what we can do is take a felt tip marker and I thought I had one right here somewhere and paint that now I'm just going to take the water off of this stone so that it doesn't take the ink off before I have a chance to tell Set that on there, just a couple of seconds of work and then flip it over. So I'm making contact to within about a quarter of an inch of this side and to within about five sixteenths, maybe three eighths of an inch of this side. Really, that's not a problem. If you want to fix it and make it a little bit better, I'm actually going to turn this over and use the heavier 300 grit side. Same thing, even pressure. Don't leave your diamond stone in water. You'll see what happens. The rust. That's my fault. Now, so I'm almost to this end, I'm almost to that end. You can take the time to finish that. It's not, that improvement is not going to be noticed, so I won't bother going any farther with that. I'd, I'd find that perfectly acceptable. Now, the chip breaker. Take the screw off. I'm gonna go back to the smooth side, or the 1000 grit. Now I wanna raise it up a little bit higher, so I'm gonna put the blade over here. And I've got to work just with the edge of this stone. And 
I've got the back side sitting on the blade so that it's slightly lower than uh, the, the top surface of the stone. So again, three fingers to distribute the pressure. Now I need to stay within a quarter of an inch of the side because if I go in there, I'm going to start bumping the underside of the chip breaker. Light to moderate pressure. The harder you push, the less control you have and the more likely you are to distort things. So the diamond stone does not need a lot of pressure to make it work. Flip that over and have a look. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to paint this black so we can tell. I'll paint this whole surface. The only part I'm concerned with touching is the outside edge, meaning right out here. If I'm touching on the inside, then that's going to leave a possible gap on the front where shavings can get trapped. And that'll serve only to clog the throat of your plane, so we don't want that. Set that on there. Just a few seconds. And flip it over. Okay, so that's what I've got. I'm working back here. I'm not working out on the edge, so what I need to do is raise this up just a little bit more. What have I got that uh, I can pick that up with? If I can do it with just a steel rule. If I can get it to stay on. Try not to wipe off that paint. Okay, I'm still not up high enough because I still haven't touched that very outside edge. So I've got to get even higher still. Maybe if I go back to using that little rubber mat. Where did I put that? Did I drop it on the floor? Yeah. And I'll use the back side of the stone again. As long as this one is lower than this, so that I still have that relief on the underside. Okay, now that's that's well, that was touching all the way, but I'm going to speed this up a little bit again. I'm going to go. And I'm going to flip it over and use the more aggressive 300 grit side. This is a one-time procedure. Once you set it up, I can't see any reason why you'd ever have to come back and do it again unless you were to drop the chip breaker and damage the leading edge. Okay, now I'm just going to finish this. Now I would expect I'm going to find a burr on the back side. So I'll show you how to deal with that. And there is a burr. That's good because I know I've worked right out here to the edge. In fact, I don't know if you can pick it up or not, but I can see in the light how it's shiny all the way along that outside edge. So I just want to get rid of that burr, and this metal is fairly soft, so what I'll do is register that main bevel on this stone, elevate it just slightly, just a few seconds, very similar to putting a secondary bevel on the blade itself, flip it over, do it one more time. And if I still feel a burr, I'll take it off with a piece of wood, but I expect it'll be gone. Yeah, there might be a little something there. I'll just grab a piece of hardwood and just fold that a few times. If there's any burr left on there, it should come off. Okay, make sure that's good and dry so I don't leave any moisture on there to rust. Okay. 
So the last thing is our blade. Now we've prepared the blade in previous videos, so I'll just go through this real quick. I'm going to use a little steel rule and employ what's called the Charlesworth ruler trick. This is a technique that David Charlesworth, a well-known English craftsman, developed back in the mid-70s. And it bypasses the need to have to go in and flatten and polish all of the back of the blade only to use right out here. Instead, we simply flatten and polish a little strip on the leading edge on the back side of the blade. And I do that by elevating the blade slightly on a steel rule, working within a quarter of an inch of the edge, using three fingers to distribute the pressure as evenly as possible. Now, I do this a lot. So I've used my pinky over here to run along the side of the stone so that while I'm moving this forward and back, I'm not drifting in and out. Depending on the condition of the back of your blade, and I'll go over this with you real quick. There's four conditions that the blade may uh, may show up. It can be perfectly flat, which you'd know that because your polished strip would be a nice uniform strip running all the way across corner to corner. It could be slightly concave, and that's okay too, because slightly concave means you're going to have two resting points, and you'll simply work it until they rejoin and there's a continuous polished strip. And you'd know that because there would be a slight arc. So the slight arc tells you it's slightly concave. Don't worry about it. Now. If it's convex and you've got one high point here, it's going to be very difficult to ever get this right because it's constantly going to be rocking because of that one contact point. I'd actually return it if it was convex. And the fourth way is uh, that it may appear is it could be twisted. And if it's badly twisted, you'll get a big triangular shape. Now this has got a little bit, but not enough to uh, disqualify it. In fact, I can see with, I'm having to adjust it to the light, but I can see a polished strip that starts here and goes all the way over. Now I want to make it just a little bit bigger than that before I say, okay, good to go. But as long as the strip is continuous corner to corner or edge to edge, and long as it's deep enough, now let me explain this one. There's grinding scratches on the back of the blade that came from the factory. And those grinding scratches, if allowed to carry out to the end of the blade, will result in a serrated edge, and that would leave nicks or ridges in the wood. So what we're doing, whereas we used to flatten and polish all of this to get rid of those, we are putting this little back bevel that will cut down below the bottom of them, or get to the bottom of them so that they disappear. And when you run your fingernail along that edge, you can't feel any nicks whatsoever. So that may take a minute, it may take three or four minutes. But even though I'm all, I've already got that polished strip, I'm gonna just ensure there's nothing there by making it a little bit bigger. Remember to stay within a quarter of an inch of the edge and to keep the pressure that you're applying with these three fingers as even as possible. Now I hold the steel rule in place with my opposite index finger. And you always want to use the same steel rule, in other words you're changing, if you're changing thicknesses or widths, you're going to alter that bevel. And there's no reason to change that once I have it established. Okay. Now that I have, I can see a, a nice polished strip side to side, I'm going to go in, I'm going to get rid of the 1000 grit scratches by replacing them with the 16,000 grit. Now I've just got to get rid of some of this crud on the stone so that it sits flat. I normally do all of this at the end of my bench, but the initial prep work is nice to be able to stand up. But I'll take you through my sharpening system again. And for that, I want to have it so that I can lean over the stone. I just put a little water on there. Put a little in there too so that if there's any debris it'll dissolve and allow that stone to sit flat. Now I use the 300 grit side of my diamond plate to keep this 16,000 grit flat and true. I 
know that looks a little dirty, but it'll still work. Same, same steel rule. Set that on the edge. Lubricate it a little bit. Flip the blade over on its back. Three fingers. Now it's a big jump going from 1,000 to 16,000, but the surface area is small enough that it won't take very long to eliminate those 1,000 grit scratches. This too is a one-time procedure. I have yet to have to go back and redo my back bevel because of grinding on a blade over time. So the little bit that I do to this each time I sharpen obviously is enough to keep that back bevel functional. Okay, so I've got a polished strip. Goes all the way over the other side. We'll test it in, on the wood to make sure. Now, we'll go through our sharpening routine. For that, I'm gonna go over here to my sharpening station. Out of habit, I always keep the coarse one on the right, on the left, sorry, and the fine one on the right. So this is a first time sharpening. Actually, I got some debris in there I wanna get rid of. I'm gonna set my blade down on the primary bevel, raise it up three or four degrees, about 10 seconds of work. Now the nice thing about this trend diamond plate is that it cuts fast enough you could probably do this in five seconds, but I go 10 just to be sure. And at the end of 10 seconds, I'll verify that I got what I want by feeling for a burr that runs corner to corner, and that one does. Then I'm gonna leave the 1000 and come over to the 16. I've never bothered to uh, worry about con cross contamination. I don't think you're gonna lift any diamond grit off of there, but if you are, you can wipe off the blade before you do this. Come over here to the 16,000. Hold the blade the same way, four fingers, distribute the pressure as evenly as possible. Find that primary bevel, raise up a few degrees higher than I did on the 1000 when I created that secondary bevel. On this one we're actually producing a very small third or tertiary bevel. About 10 seconds of work on this one. Rocking heel and toe so I can move over the entire surface of the stone and I don't wear one spot prematurely. At the end of 10 seconds, I put downward pressure in one corner for three seconds and switch to the opposite corner for three seconds. Try not to change anything other than putting pressure like this and then pressure like that. Final step is to take the steel rule, lay it on the edge of the stone, and all we're doing is deburring. Set that on here using the opposite quarter inch edge. And if you've ever seen the, uh, the wire burr, can you see that? There's the wire burr that just fell off. Can you see it? If you can, I'll put something white right behind it. Can you pick it up? And that's not a hair. That's actually a steel burr. Yep. So just three seconds is all it takes. Wipe off any moisture on there. Now I had that rubber on there just to protect my bench. Put the lever cap in place. I like to do it this way. Pull it back, then move it over. I can squeeze it between my index finger and my thumb. I have lots of control as I move it forward. Now, the back doesn't need to be perfect. And you can see that it isn't. All I need is to have that little strip, highly polished, running side to side. And like I said, we'll put it to work to prove whether or not this quick process actually does what we say it does. Now when we put this in place, we want to make sure that the blade lays flat against the face of the frog. We want the yoke to go into that slot in the chip breaker so it has to pass through the blade to get to there. And this bearing on the bottom of the lateral adjustment lever has to fit in the long slot of the blade. And sometimes that's a tight fit, so you want to make sure that it sits down there so that that's nice and lays nice and tight up against the face of the frog. Put your lever cap on. Now I want enough pressure 
that the blade won't move accidentally, but not so much pressure that I can't make adjustments with some ease. So I usually tell by how hard it is to adjust it laterally. And because of this setup, every time you take the blade out and put it back, it'll come back to the exact same spot. And that feels about right. Now, while sighting down the sole, I look for the blade and you just tip the sole a little bit and the blade will show up, or at least it will show up as you advance it. And you advance it by spinning the adjuster knob in a clockwise rotation as you're looking at it from that direction. Once you can see the blade, you want it to be parallel to the sole. If it isn't parallel to the sole, every time you take a pass, on the edge of a board, you're actually going to throw it at a square because you're going to take a little more off of one side than the other. So I'll do what I can with the lateral adjustment lever to move it into position. And then as I retract it, the blade will, will eventually disappear. And just as it disappears, that gives me an opportunity to fine tune that lateral adjustment. And then I'll pull it all the way in so I don't see any blade at all. A little piece of... Uh, uh, I was going to say candle wax, but this is canning wax, paraffin, just a long squiggly S like that. And all that's designed to do is simply reduce the friction between the wood and the sole of the plane. Now actually I was looking for a nice big thick piece of maple. I might need to shut the camera down for just a second. I'm going to get a big piece of hard maple and we'll really give this a test. Okay, this is a big th thick piece of uh, eastern maple, quite a hardwood. That surface has been jointed on a power jointer. So the first thing I've got to do is get rid of any of the, uh, uh, the mill marks. So while I'm planing, I'm going to start advancing the adjuster knob. And what I'm doing is I'm spinning that in a clockwise rotation and I'm sneaking up on this board. Now I'm starting to see shaving right in the middle of the blade and that's actually what I want. If it was off a little bit to one side or the other, I'd make a slight adjustments now. Once I get rid of these, with the tops of these uh, ripples that are a result of a circular cutting head, we can get a better shaving. Now I'm getting a little more on the right than I am the left. So to rectify that, I'm going to push the lateral adjustment lever toward the high side. And that causes the blade to shift like this. Okay, a little more wax. I'm going to retract that blade a little bit. See if we can go for a thinner shaving. Sometimes watch to see, I watch to see which way the shaving goes when it comes out of the plane. If it rolls off to the right or to the left, if it rolls off to the right, you're probably a little bit thicker on this side than you are on that side. So what I'll do is make the adjustment. But when that comes out and lays that direction, or right with the plane, then it should be parallel to the side. Nice and smooth. Smooth and finished. That's all there is to it. Now if we had time, we could do this that side as well, but... That's another video. Anyway, so there's your Wood River four and a half. Um, priced at half of what the competition is asking. I think it has all the same tolerances. May not have as much spit polish, but if all you're looking for is a plane that's going to do the job. Oh, actually I told you I'd, I'd show you uh, its function on the shooting board. So let me do that real quick before we close. You're shooting the edge or the end of a piece of maple now this board is nine and a half inches wide. So that's the harder of all the cuts that we take. Cutting through the end grain is typically the toughest. So what you want is you want some mass. You also want some length ahead of the blade. You can't start back here. You've got to stay engaged or else you're going to slam into the side of the board. I'm going to put a little bit of wax on the bottom side of this. better. 
Now, actually this is not square as you can see. So the first thing I've got to do is flip this over and I've got to cut a chamfer on this side. If I don't, I would risk having the fibers break out as the blade passes by the end of the board. Now that I flip this over, that'll give me a chamfer right there. It'll allow me to come in. That's a little too heavy. And I'm gonna come back and do that even deeper. Nice clean cut. There's your end grain shaving coming off of that piece of maple. That's a heck of a lot faster and more accurate than sanding. But you want some mast on the plane so you can carry through that cut and you need some length between the blade and the end of the plane so you can have a bit of a run at it. There's your five and a half. My recommendation for your first plane if you're a small person or female, you may want to look at the number five. Roughly the same length, a little bit lighter, a little bit easier to handle, but I really prefer that extra weight. Enjoy it.